My name's Tom Fisher. I'm the Dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota, and it's really uh, great to be here. Uh, this is, I, like many of you, I go to a lot of conferences. This is by far my favorite conference. Uh, there is so much content, as I think you will find in the next few days, that is so uh, powerful and very useful. So um, we do want to make these uh, uh, conversations, so think about questions as you're listening to the speakers, and we have a kind of conversational format here for the Q&A, and I'll be watching for uh, you to raise your hand, so do, do uh, participate and be involved. Um, this is our fifth uh, summit, and uh, every year it's gotten bigger and bigger. I think we have 300 plus registrants uh, this year. And how many of you uh, are here for the first time to a geodesign summit? Wow, a lot. It's amazing. Really, that's great. Um, we, uh, you know, we have uh, people from 16 industries, 19 different countries, and 33 states. So this has really become an international um, uh, phenomenon. Um, how many of you are uh, primarily academics, teachers, faculty? Okay, so a good number. How about practitioners? My sense we have a lot of a growing number of practitioners, good. Um, let's see, students, I know we have, okay. Good, starting to get students, great. Uh, who else? Uh, state and local government, do we have? Okay, a few, good. Um, we, you know, when we looked across the disciplines, we have uh, attendees from architecture, banking, biology, conservation, design, development, ecology, forestry, finance, health, insurance, landscape architecture, mining, marine science, oil and gas, planning, parks, transportation, sanitation, urban design, and water, among others. So uh, I think that gives you a sense of how diverse we are uh, in terms of our disciplines, um, which is fantastic. I mentioned how we have people from multiple countries. Uh, the geodesign summits have started to happen elsewhere. Uh, this past year, we had a summit in uh, Europe, in Holland, where we had about 250 uh, in attendance, and we had one in Beijing, China, which had uh, not only 500 in the audience, but uh, 50,000 online. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the interest in this field and uh, its uh, growing audience. I think another uh, measure of its uh, popularity and its emergence has been the rise in the number of academic programs that are uh, involved in this. Uh, Kellyanne Foster did a really great article in the Fall Arc News on this, but uh, I mean there are programs in Penn State, Philadelphia University, Northern Arizona, USC, uh, Universities of Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, and I know that there are a lot of other schools that have courses and are thinking about programs. And I think that um, that again shows that there's a lot of student interest, faculty interest, and a growing sense that this is a valuable skill set uh, in the work world. So um, uh, I think you will see uh, the, f the range of applications of geodesign in the next two days and um, look forward to also hearing from all of you. We have a lot of breaks in this conference with the idea that we want you to be networking as much as possible uh, during the breaks, uh, so please do that. Uh, just a minute, I thought I would just talk about, so what is geodesign, which is a question that uh, you probably get as much, much as I do. There's been a, an interesting uh, back and forth by email that uh, Carl Steinitz and Tess Canfield have had with uh, Mike Flaxman, who I know is here, and Stephen Irwin. Um, and uh, after a few variations, um, I think this is its current definition, which is geodesign applies systems thinking to the creation of proposals for change and impact simulations in their geographic contexts, usually supported by digital technology. So uh, this is a uh, evolving definition. But uh, the way I, I uh, think about it is um, that it is uh, something that is a, a kind of marriage of uh, the incredible spatial power of um, uh, both uh, uh, GIS and geography and design. It's a coming together of these two fields in ways that hasn't happened before, and GIS has been the uh, way in which th th that has happened. 
Um, and I think, obviously, both these fields of uh, uh, geography and design are about the planet and about the, pe the people and the various species that live on the planet. But one of the things that I think is a contribution that geodesign makes is that uh, it marries the data-rich analytical power of GIS with the creative, uh, speculative, synthesizing methods of design. And uh, in some ways, I think about that uh, over time, which is that GIS is this powerful tool to help us understand the world as it was and as it is. And design is a very powerful method to think about the world as it could be. And so marrying that ability to understand what we face today, what we know about the world, and then what are we going to do about it, makes geodesign uh, particularly powerful at a time when we have got to figure that out pretty fast, and it's probable that the things we're going to be doing in the future are going to be quite different from what we've been doing in the past, because what we've been doing in the past hasn't been working very well. Uh, and so I think that this is the kind of thing that drives a lot of us here, is that this is um, the uh, way in which we will uh, increasingly be um, uh, working in the future. And um, I think uh, as we uh, envision these uh, uh, pr uh, projects, as we see these projects, we'll see many more applications. I was in a breakfast meeting this morning with a group of uh, representatives from some of the health systems here uh, in the Inland Empire, thinking about how do we use geodesign tools to basically create a healthier population. So those are the kinds of questions that are starting to uh, come to, uh, to geodesign and, and to this movement. Well, um, none of this would have happened without the, the vision of Esri uh, and without the, the vision of its founder and president, Jack Dangerman, who I'm, I know you all know of, many of you know, um, and as somebody who has himself over his career sort of straddled this field this, of being both in uh, the GIS world as well as uh, coming out of landscape architecture, out of a design discipline. Uh, this has been uh, something that has really emerged from Jack's vision and uh, I thought it would be best if we heard it from Jack himself. So please welcome Jack Dangerman. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. How are you? I see some old faces that are really my friends, <laughs> and then many people that I've never met before. So welcome to Redlands, welcome to this conference, and um, that's a very heavy load that you put on my shoulders, that it would have not happened without me. I think that's absolutely not true. Um, in many ways, geodesign is something that I think is inevitable, and I think it's built on the notion that we don't have a sustainable way of doing things right now. We're going to have to shift. That's a good context for us to think about. And you, as practitioners, particularly you uh, in the academy, but also in private practice, uh, I think will become the instruments for realizing geodesign in the future. Currently, you and I are living at a time where we're facing some challenges which are enormous. Uh, things that, that couldn't be fathomed even a few decades ago. These deal with continued population growth, the change that that's having on our land uses, the change that it's impacting in terms of climate, and on and on. You can't pick up the newspaper without this every single day in our face. And what is, what is the counterbalance to these trends who are the people that have the big ideas to stop it, other than micro changes here and there? I think it's in the world of design, um, and more specifically in this field of emerging geodesign, geographically changing what we do, or changing what we do geographically, and, and affecting these challenges. Collectively, we need to create a better future. This is what Bran Farron told us last year at this conference. We need to bring all of the best science and the best technology and the best design thinking to address these sorts of challenges, particularly in this generation. So I suspect that it's not by chance that we are here. It's inevitable that there has to be a reaction to the kinds of trends that are emerging and impacting 
our world today. I'm going to talk a bit about GIS because I think it is essential as a foundation technology to enable geo design in the 21st century. GIS is providing us a kind of technological platform for integrating our sciences. <clears throat> I like to say it's integrating our ologies. And this, this concept came from Ian McCarg, a famous landscape architect of uh, the last century, who talked at length about the notion of wanting to bring together all of the sciences as a foundation for designing the future. He certainly would enjoy this conference and, and being here. And in some ways, his spirit is here. He talked about the idea of integrating the ologies, geology, hydrology, sociology, climatology. Um, and what he did not have is the power of technology, another one of those ologies, to bring it all together. But he had the concept of it clear. Um, GIS has emerged in the last couple of decades as a powerful platform for visualizing geography, for integrating, for quantitatively analyzing uh, all of the processes and patterns and relationships uh, that, that exist out there. And while it's still, I would say, in its early stages of uh, evolution, it's proven to us as a powerful tool for systematically and comprehensively approaching uh, our world. It's also provided us the practical means, a tool that we can actually use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think we might say it empowers this next step that it must take uh, of geodesign. What is it? Geodesign has lots of definitions, but for me it's taking geographic knowledge, integrating it with the design process, and allowing us to create alternative plans and evaluate them and make better decisions. And this process is not the domain of simply designers or planners or um, it, it actually belongs to virtually all of us in almost every field. Um, I liked that Tom mentioned we've got insurance people and banking people and people who do retail site selection and also we have many design-based uh, professionals here. Because this is a kind of pervasive, I think it will become a kind of pervasive technology. Cle clearly the, the definitions keep evolving and I, I am so enchanted with this uh, conversation, Carl, that you and, and others uh, have been having because it, it suggests that we're try kept, keep trying to get it right. But it is certainly cross-disciplinary and it encompasses many of the concepts, uh, many methodologies. It's, it's, uh, I would say it's almost innate to us as human beings. And these words are going to be talked about during this conference. The definitions are going to be talked about again and again. And we will see some very exciting applications. And again, these applications are across many fields. These slides reflect some of your work in in urban planning and master planning and in building healthy communities and economic development. These slides suggest that it's being used in open space planning and, and resource planning and in conservation. From urban gardens to master planning to locating where Harley Davidson motorcycle <laughs> stores should be. Uh, lots of different uh, churn here, from bike routes to bus routes, looking at alternatives, understanding their consequences based on strong science information. Geodesign is beginning to be applied at the building space or campus space in organizing and arranging optimum solutions for room, room configurations. Um, it's being applied to food production and to uh, risk assessment and flood, flood, flood analytics, for example, in order to mitigate or plan for disasters. It's helping us pick where <coughs> we can pick 
the best place for wind or solar or other energy uh, development. GIS is about integration for me. That's been uh, sort of the thing that, that occurs to me, both integration of the data, bringing the ologies together like I mentioned, but the other, the other interesting dimension of it is that indirectly it has the ability to integrate people in common conversations using geospatial information. It breaks down some of the barriers. I first realized this in Carl Steinitz's class um, that he brought together many different departments and Harvard uh, into a laboratory, economists, water people, planning people, landscape architects and others. And they held a conversation about the future of Boston using a gaming simulation GIS based uh, iteration. People began to learn from each other and collaborate from each other in this setting. And I think that's part of the magic is not only data integration or knowledge integration, but also people integration in a conversation with a common language. This is powerful. If we think about some of the problems, I mean, how many of you watched the president's uh, speech last night? Um, in the United States here, we have the, um, you know, the annual uh, State of the Union address. In that room, uh, it's kind of scary because it's filled with people that don't want to cooperate or are on a position or see things differently. Everything from healthcare to the environment. Um, and I keep thinking if they only had a map, <laughs> somehow a way to bring, bring their thoughts together and see it and understand the consequences of their conversations or their scenarios. Uh, for me, this is, this is sort of, um, symbolic of what GIS represents. It's certainly what has motivated me is to take, take away some of the bullshit politics stuff and bring it into a science frame where people can actually understand things and, and build the future together. GIS and now increasingly geodesign with its methodologies and terms I would assert are changing how we think and how we act. Now that's a lot to say there. By integrating geographic science into what we do, all of these words of measuring and predicting and planning and analyzing and designing and evaluating and deciding, that whole kind of workflow that some of you have written books about, um, is interesting. The problem is that only a few people use it. Increasingly, there are people using it, but really, there's only a few people using it. And given those challenges that we're facing, this has got to change um, if we're going to really actually turn it around. So as a technologist, I think I think a lot about um, you know, the impact of technology, but uh, this little device had a huge impact. We can now all get connected with each other, talk, email, text. And now that it's become geospatially enabled, we can know where each other is and how to get there and all of that. In that sense, this little stupid device, not so stupid, but has, is transforming our relationship with the planet and with each other. I keep thinking, couldn't we do the same thing with GIS and geodesign? If GPS and image, satellite images and all of the technologies associated with this device were able to reach now about a third of the planet, couldn't we do the same thing with GIS so that um, the foundation of geodesign could actually be at the fingertips of, of virtually everyone. So I, I think the answer is that we could. So also I would assert and try to make the point in a couple minutes that that is, a, that is exactly what's going to happen. If we look at GIS in its history, it has been 
a system for organizing digitally geographic information so that we can use it in various domains. And it has been applied in cadastral parcel mapping, in forestry, in the organization of natural resource data. It's been used in automated map making by cartographers. It's had a rich and multidisciplinary domain. Um, it involves organizing data, transactionally updating it, and being able to use it for graphics and analytics in various ways. Pretty, pretty interesting history. Um, and so it has brought this vision of integration of information and collaboration to many different people. GIS is now being implemented in a number of different patterns. The desktop, millions of people are using that. The development of the internet and services has meant that we can publish map services and geo services so that many people can see maps. The evolution in a sort of third stage to the cloud-based or web-based systems has meant that it can be actually become pervasive. And it's that, it's that area that I want to talk about as a background for the next couple of days of discussion. Because this new pattern, the kind of web GIS as I'll call it, will transform everything. It'll bring the very thoughts and analytic tools and design tools that we are pioneering uh, in this room with you to everyone else. It integrates a lot of trends. In the press, we hear a lot about big data or faster machines or devices for everyone or more measurement. And speaking about measurement, measurement virtually of everything with new dimensions of LIDAR and remote sensing, GPS, pervasive context, is, content is now a word that's catching on. <coughs> it's this web GIS will integrate all of, all of it. And it'll come to us in the form of apps that have pervasive reach that everyone can use with online content accessible through the apps and the ability to do, manage my own content, my own little view of the world. Um, and it'll be easy and it'll be collaborative. So this future will make not only GIS easier and always available, it'll be the foundation again of what geodesign really uh, is all about. Uh, pervasive access to the whole stack of ologies together with analytic tools and ultimately design tools from any device. It's important to understand the little details about how this works. Let's start with this. First, any kind of information can be integrated. Our traditional map data and image data and services, but also tabular data like spreadsheets to big enterprise databases, social media data, real-time sensor network data, and reaching back into the very large volumes of our of our history, as Tom mentioned, big data feeds so we can see the whole thing. Now this pattern is built on something called web services or web maps as I like to call them. So if we look back in the history when Ian McCarg was still around, our technology was about map overlay as the digital world emerged and computational geography was realized, we could see these in a GIS database, multiple views on a single set of information. But it had to be in one data bank. <laughs> and that was troublesome because reality, um, measured by the different ologies, has its own little, um, what do you call it, domain. Um, you know, its own classification system for the data. 
the own, their own data models or their own way of organizing reality. Are you with me on this? So when you try to put it all in one data bank, different people, well, they didn't want to do it because it required one computer and also it required bending the data models so that they would, uh, in a way, compromise the truth. <laughs> Maybe some of you have not been in those meetings before. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> this new pattern is interesting because it allows us to take distributed data sets in as services, kind of like this. I can read in any data set as a web map or a REST service and integrate it dynamically over the web rather than putting it into a database in the beginning. This is really quite transformational and it's been sort of sneaking up on us um, over the last couple of years. What does it mean? It means that I can visually overlay these um, dynamic distributed services. The dynamic distributed services can be kept in the location of whoever creates them and they serve it as services rather than centralize it. This is organizationally interesting. It means not only can I visually overlay it, I can also do spatial analytics against it. Uh, the backbone of what geo design is all about, being able to analyze, predict, interpret information, not just visually, not just through mashups, but actually online distributed modeling. This is starting to emerge. It's not perfect yet, but it's where the technology will go. This will help us take all of the information in different institutions and bring it together dynamically. It means that people can keep their data in their own little, what do you call it? Silo, silo. okay, silo. <laughs> Each of us have our own names, our own little dirt ball of existence. <laughs> and this technology can dynamically bring it together. This creates new possibilities, enormously new possibilities um, that will support more collaborative approaches. And as people s learn to serve their data, not simply open data, but open services, as they learn how to serve their information across the web, they will learn how to serve each other and collaborate. That has enormous implications. WebGIS becomes a platform where geospatial professionals who are maintaining their data sets in geocentric forms serve their information to knowledge workers, to designers, to the public. It works on any device and can integrate in with the big databases in the sky that run most organizations. This will make mapping and ultimately geodesign available to everyone across organizations and beyond. Now, what is the technology behind this? First off, cloud with its huge resources for organizing and management of data is coming alive with live data services. These are ready-to-use maps, not data that have to be uh, manipulated and worked on. It just sort of cuts a lot of that stuff out because GIS professionals build it and maintain it. So we'll be able to have the best available and global data sets available to use. Um, these include base maps of all kinds, topographic base maps, street base maps, image based maps, and some of you are using this, so you know what I mean. <clears throat> it also includes demographic data and also landscape data. So instead of spending in the private sector half of your time gathering up all the data so that you can begin to do design, I just connect and start using it. Instead of spending <clears throat> half of the studio time in an academy 
getting students. I think that was it, Carl. Half of the bloody semester <laughs> was gathering all the data, key punching all that crap in, getting the maps run, learning Fortran at the same time. It was tough. I mean, today, students can simply dial in and just like with iMusic, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Apple's, I, I don't need, uh, yeah, right, iTunes, what did I, uh, sorry, don't ever quote me on that. Instead of, I can just listen to the music and start to use the music. This is a big change. So it's not only uh, like that, but it's also available. Apps on these devices provide the access. Um, viewing and query, field data collection, mapping, uh, situation awareness, story maps. These kinds of apps come alive. And I realize that, you know, uh, this is only 2014. And apps are just starting. Imagine the plethora of apps that will emerge in the next five years. It's just beginning that leverage these kinds of investments. Landscape Planner app, they're going to show this, is a project that my colleagues have been working on for the last, uh, I guess, two years, really. It's collecting all the landscape information in the United States. We're now working on Africa. That allows people to then, in an app, design a project, organize their data that they're going to use, run some analytics, evaluate them, basically following uh, Dr. Steinitz's methodology to quickly design and evaluate quick uh, impacts. And we'll see presentations on this uh, thing, although this is just one example of what's going to emerge. Desktop GIS complements the the world of lightweight apps that run on anything. They allow us to do data compilation and more heavy-duty analytics and uh, visualization in various ways. So these two worlds, the app world, the desktop world, run on a server services uh, basis connected by the web. That's the way this actually works. And in the desktop space, we're also seeing advancements, and we'll see this week some new capabilities in the form of procedural modeling. Procedural modeling is a kind of new capability. It's an old capability, but it's a new capability and interesting for 3D GIS. This procedural modeling, I wouldn't say really started in Hollywood, but that's where it got its, its, uh, its real uh, launch in making movies, in designing sets, in building very large uh, background sets, you know, like a set <laughs> for movies like uh, Cars. And I, I'm almost embarrassed to say all the names of these movies because they're so weird. Uh, <laughs> but the world of animation popularized this notion of being able to use rules uh, to build these visualization sets. Procedural design tools provide a very flexible way to visualize and analyze uh, cities. I have landscapes. They're rules-driven, so you build a little rule um, that expresses a building, and in the rule you can embed things like um, uh, the impact of that building on water usage or runoff or the impact of that building on traffic. So as you build the buildings, you can quickly analyze the implications of it. And this procedural design tools is interoperable with other things like 3D CAD or um, other 3D visualizations. I think this will, this is also just emerging, but uh, has, has tremendous power. Procedural design, we would say, is smart. That's a way to describe it. It's data-centric, but rule-centric as well. So you set up these rules, and as these two diagrams show, you have a design and its evaluation built in the design. 
the infiltration rate of the top pair shows the runoff of, of uh, this particular design expression. Uh, or the design and its housing inside of a 3D envelope or a 3D um, zoning envelope. So you can set up performance measures or performance reports based on the design. You're designing and evaluating at the same time. Procedural design is, has been applied in a number of uh, landmark cases. This one it was in Honolulu. Um, it was the transit-oriented design to get people in and out of downtown, and the impacts visually are shown on the, on the right of with transit, without transit. And the mayor, who presented a few years ago at our users' conference, <laughs> lost the election. But anyway, he was great. <laughs> he, was, he at least understood this, but uh, it didn't do him any good, actually. But. Yeah, it's too bad. You get the idea. Quickly, I can evaluate alternative scenarios. And um, while it costs about the same, we've been doing some assessments of this, to do it with procedural design or without, the difference is that you can look at many, many alternatives and evaluate the quantitative um, impacts of this. So it's, it's pretty powerful. This is <clears throat> another interesting part about this procedural design tool is that we, um, what has been invented is the ability to do 3D visualization without plugins in a browser. For some of you, that'll be impressive. For most of you, it won't be. But imagine that I could share a 3D model like this in a browser and allow citizens without any software, this is all running without software, by the way, to look at before and after scenarios like this, um, or do shade and um, shadow analysis of a building configuration, or look at things like uh, 3D zoning as it relates to a city plan, or looking at crime rate as it relates to an urban environment, um, or uh, looking at, um, you know, you get the idea? I build an expensive 3D model. How do I get it so that people can actually look at it? This web scene capability allows me to basically share 3D realities with citizens with nothing more than a browser or a device to be able to look at it. That's a technological breakthrough. Uh, while this is not something that you haven't seen before, um, it certainly illustrates uh, what's possible given a shift in the technology like this. So technology matters in many cases. Uh, it can really help us. It can help us accelerate the concepts and visions of geodesign further. 3D ex expanding across the geospatial platforms uh, and they, they, they will become pervasive uh, data set, there will become pervasive data sets on, on these technologies. And I think getting back to my plot, I think GIS and more importantly geodesign will become pervasive uh, for ev in, in, everybody's, in everybody's fingertips. It'll require apps, however, <laughs> uh, to be able to make this happen. And these apps are not going to be built by one person or one organization. Uh, this technology has to be open and available for young entrepreneurs to develop all kinds of new apps, citizen-facing apps, uh, student-facing apps, professional-facing apps. So m my forecast is that the world is going to be full of these sorts of apps built on a geospatial infrastructure, which is distributed, um, multi-participant, open, and easily accessible. This new technology, uh, I think, will transform the concepts of geodesign and accelerate it. The purpose of this meeting is, in many ways, to understand the technologies and methods, figure out how we can integrate these into various design scenarios. Many of you are building your own tools and methods, sharing those will be important. 
and another purpose is to simply figure out how we can collaborate more effectively. It's clear to me that the profession, the schools, the thinking associated with design is essential to be able to make this come about. It isn't going to come out of technologists' minds or scientists' minds. Design is essential in this endeavor. And uh, so I want you to get to know each other. Um, I, by the way, I forgot to do that. Uh, would you take a minute and uh, introduce yourself to one other person and tell them who you are, somebody that you don't know, <laughs> and uh, let them introduce themselves to you. <clears throat> Okay, good. Great, thank you. That's good. Have two more slides. Are we running too late? Good, thank you. Excellent. Good. Thanks. Stop. All right. Enough already. Yeah. What? At the break. Shh. Yes, thank you. I like to do that because it just reminds us all of the tremendous energy and, and uh, knowledge that you have in the room. Did you meet somebody interesting? Right away. So the purpose of this will be to listen to some presentations, but the bigger purpose is to get to know each other. I think geodesign as a concept is a social phenomenon. <laughs> it requires much more than technology. I'll conclude with this. I started with, we need to create a better future. That's clear. And we need to do that for our families, for our organization and ultimately the planet. Um, whatever level you want to kick in there, <laughs> it's important to acknowledge that we're on a mission. Your work clearly is already helping that. Some of you are just unbelievable in your, in your work. Um, and being able to leverage not only the science world and the technology world, but also these design talents are, are really important. I think the field that we'll talk about for two days of geodesign is going to accelerate our understanding of the planet and inspire not simply you in this room to do better or to better teach students or to do better projects, but also to inspire design thinking as a way to approach problem solving on the planet. Embracing these patterns and building on your existing knowledge, I think, can actually transform the world. I thought a lot about this last night. I think nothing, there's no other, there's no other force that I can think of which actually will do it as effectively as if we were able to um, amplify, is the right word, the very thing that you're about um, on the planet.